Thank you again, Sarah, for leading us in worship. Uh, such a great time just to be together. I'm so excited just to be worshiping God in a brand new decade, a brand new year. Uh, it's a good time. Well, I, uh, when I was about 16 years old, I was nominated to be the head boy of my secondary school. Now, in England, this is a, probably a little bit of a ridiculous tradition that some schools have, uh, especially the kind of fancier, more upper-class schools. I did not get to go to those, unfortunately. Uh, but when you go to a, a kind of a middle-class school where I was at, we kind of like to pretend that we were fancy by having a head boy and a head girl. Uh, and what the head boy was and the head girl was, was two students nominated by the teaching staff to be representatives for the school. So you would greet guests, important guests that come by to see, see the school. You would be a part of any of the kind of activities you were doing out in the community. Uh, and it seems like a really great role until one day things went really bad for me. Um, I woke up one morning getting ready for school, and on this particular day, as head boy, I was supposed to be welcoming a guest to our school, very important guest. Uh, we were an Anglican school, and so there was some members of the Anglican church coming by, and we were going to show them around the school. I think one of the newspapers was going to be there. It was going to be this big event. And so I had to be the guy that would escort him around and represent the school. Unfortunately, I woke up that morning feeling very, very unwell. Um, and I wasn't a good kid, and so I had often lied to my mother about when I felt unwell. And so I came downstairs and said, Mom, I do not feel good. I'm feeling hot. I'm feeling weird, dizzy. And my mom, as a good mom who's been duped too many times, said, you're going to school. <laughs> so I uh, head down to school. The entire walk to school, I'm not feeling good. It's getting worse. I mean, I do not feel well. And I come into the school, and the guest was arriving in maybe five or ten minutes. So myself and the head girl are sat in the lobby. I can remember it now. We were sat on two chairs, and the entrance was right here. And the guest was going to come in. And I just remember sitting in this seat, and I could hear the head girl talking to me, and it sounded like, womp, 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 womp. And all of a sudden, I was like, something bad is going to happen. Uh, the next thing I remember, I was laying in this poor girl's lap as she was screaming, and there was a police officer over me, shaking me like this, trying to get me awake. And I had passed out on this poor girl, and the, the Anglican priest was going to arrive within the next few seconds. So the police officer had to drag my semi-conscious body into the principal's office to make sure that when he came in, he didn't see a potentially dying student right there in the middle of the school hall. And so that day did not work out very well for me. I wasn't a great ambassador that day. I didn't even get to meet him, and the poor head girl had to do it all by herself. But that was not the only ambassadorial role I've held in my life, and it's not only... It's not even the most important. The most important ambassadorial role I will ever have in my life is to be an ambassador for Christ. And that's what we're talking about this week. You see, we are all of us in Christ, those who follow Jesus, who love Jesus, are called to be ambassadors for Christ. We are called to be representatives of the one who has saved us. Last week, we left off in this little two-week exploration of 2 Corinthians 5, and we were looking to begin with how all those in Christ are a new creation, that the old is gone and the new has come. That when we place our trust in Jesus, he makes us new. But it goes on to say a lot more than that. Here's what our passage says if we go back. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 reads this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. And we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We began by talking and we hopefully always begin by talking about how Jesus is God's son sent to reconcile us to himself. That he's the one who has loved us and given himself for us and in doing that he's made us new. Everything about us totally changes. And this week I want to talk about two verses on the end of this passage that kind of encapsulate an idea that we don't always think about enough. That the gospel is not just about us being saved and being made new, but it's also about us being called. The gospel 
is not only about Jesus coming to forgive us, it's about Jesus coming to call us. And we're going to think about this idea. What is the goal of the Christian life? What is the goal? There's a lot of ways we try and answer that question. Is it to get to heaven one day? Is it to make our lives look a little bit better? To tidy ourselves up? To be better people? More respectable, decent, selfless? Is it to gain better insight about creation? To understand the value of all things and all people? To be a more enlightened person? All of these have an element of truth in them. All of them have little bits, but these are not the goal. This is not the goal of the Christian life. They are a part of the Christian life, but not the goal. The goal is told to us in verses 20 and 21. This is what it says. Therefore, therefore meaning that everything that Jesus has done thus far, reconciling us to himself, bringing us to God, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. The goal of the Christian life is not to get into heaven. It is to be restored to a relationship with the Father so that you can live out a message and a life of reconciliation. The goal of Christian life is not to get to heaven. It is to represent Jesus here on the earth, to represent his kingdom. That's the goal. And so we're going to look at that goal in two ways this morning. First, through Paul's phrase, the righteousness of God. And then secondly, through his phrase, ambassadors for Christ. And we're going to be a little bit odd about it this morning because we are going to go through this passage in reverse, starting with 21 and then moving to verse 20. Because I think when we go through the passage and we take a closer look that way, we will see that we are not only recipients of grace, but we are messengers of grace. That this is the goal of what Jesus has done. This is why he has changed us, why he has rescued us, why he has loved us. So first, let's talk about the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, during the Christmas season, uh, it's a tradition for many families to go and see the Christmas lights. Uh, and you sometimes will go to these bigger shows that have been put on. So my wife and I this year decided to take our kids to Moose Heart. Is there anybody who's ever gone along to the Moose Heart Christmas lights? They put on a really, really good set of lights. It's really fun to take the kids along. So we went over there. Uh, we went in our little van with Christmas music playing, and uh, we had all the kids wrapped up, bundled in the back, ready to see all the different lights. But I was not in a good mood that night. Uh, I was just being rather grumpy, and uh, I had never gone to Musa before. So as we were getting out the house, uh, my wife said, do you want me to put it in the GPS? you want us to find the way to get into the entrance for the Moose Heart lights? And I said, no, I don't need to do that. I'm the master of this family. I can find things by ESP or something like that. I know how to get anywhere without using a map. So we get in the car, and my wife is just very graciously, because she's a gracious woman, saying, well, should we just have it ready in that way if we get lost or we, we can't find the entrance? And I'm just like, no, I've got this. So we're driving, and I know generally where Moose Heart is, so we drive around, but there's no entrance for the Christmas lights that I can see. I can see the Christmas lights, but I don't know how to get into Moose Heart. So I end up driving all the way around. I make it to Randall and come around that side. It was very humiliating. And that whole way, I did not want to relent. I'm stubborn, as all men are stubborn, and I did not want to give my wife the pleasure of knowing that she had the right way, ready to go. And if I just listened to her, if I'd just done what she said, she would have found me the entrance to Moose Heart. Now, we all in our lives have played that game with God a little bit. This game of thinking that we know what's right, that we know what's better. And we're told in 2 Corinthians that this is what God has done for us. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, what is the righteousness of God? What is that? The righteousness of God is quite simply his rightness. It's his perfection. It's that in all his ways, in all his decisions, in all of his will, God is right. He is good. He always works what's best. And because God is righteous, he is therefore the standard for everything else to be called righteous. So if we are to be called righteous, the standard by which we can measure that and understand that and say that we are righteous people is by measuring ourselves against God. 
is by standing next to God. And when we do that, we're not going to look righteous. We're not going to look even close to righteous when we stand next to God. Because the problem for you and I is that we are not righteous. Just like I did with my wife, we have all of us played a game in which God has set a standard for us and a way to go, and we have left it. We don't want it. We become self-righteous, meaning that we want to decide for ourselves what's right, what's wrong, what the best way to travel is. We go off-road and ignore God's leading in his word and in his law. And we're told in both Proverbs 14, 12 and in Proverbs 16, 25, the same phrase repeated, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. All of us have played this game of trying to take control of the navigation of our lives and become self-righteous, become unrighteous, because we are not as we ought to be. You and I were not created to be the governors of our own lives. We were not created to be the measure of our own right and wrong. God alone is righteous and is that standard. And so this lack of righteousness not only gets us lost and off course, but it gets us in debt. It puts us in debt. Because everything about us was created to reflect and image God to this world. And so when we become self-righteous, when we get off course, we're no longer reflecting the God who is righteous whose ways are better and true and good. And so we need someone who can reconcile us. We need someone who can not only pay our debt, but can get us back on course, who can find our way home. And the only one who can do that is one who is righteous. So if you and I are not righteous, and that there is none righteous in the earth, who is it to be? Only God. Only God himself. And so at Christmas, we celebrate the God, the righteous one who came down as a man, Jesus Christ, who is the righteousness of God in the flesh. He is perfect and blameless in all of his ways. He is love and mercy, faithfulness, kindness, self-control, generosity, service personified. God stooping to serve and love human beings. He was he who knew no sin. That's what this passage is referring to when it says, God made for our sake him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus, the one who was God's righteousness. And at the cross, he went and he made a trade. He made an exchange, something that the uh, reformer Martin Luther called the great exchange. Where Jesus says before his father on the cross, take my righteous life. Take my perfect, blameless, holy life and give it to them. Everything I have ever done to uphold your righteousness, Father, everything I've ever done to obey you and serve you and love you as you deserve in righteousness, give that to them. Give them my record. Give them my nature. Give them my character. Make them a new creation so that they can be like me. And he said, in exchange, Father, I will take all of their unrighteousness. I will take all of their sin. Give me all of their brokenness. Give me people's anger, their bitterness, their jealousy, their cruelty, their selfishness. And I will become sin for them so that they might become the righteousness of God. They might be the righteousness of God. Paul says in Romans 3, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. What Paul is telling us there is that because we have not followed God's law, because we have been unable to follow God's law, now Jesus has come to be our standard of righteousness and to be the one through whom we can become righteous. And here's what this exchange should do for you and I. First of all, it should bring us humility. If we understand that this is what Jesus did for us, that this is the exchange that Jesus Christ made for us on that cross, it should erase any self-righteousness we could have. Because look at what he was willing to do. Look at the lengths to which God was willing to go to rescue you and me. Unbelievable lengths. Painful 
lengths out of love and mercy and grace. He hung on a cross for you and me so that it would melt away any sense of self-righteousness we have because we would scarcely die for a good man, whereas Christ died for sinners. It will also bring us to praise. Because when we see this, someone loving us so spectacularly, someone so willing to give his life for us, how can that not make us sing? That's why we sing in church. That's why we worship is because we shouldn't be able to hold it in. We shouldn't be able to restrain ourselves from wanting to tell people about this amazing God who has done above and beyond to love us and rescue us, to redeem us and bring us back, to pay our debts. And lastly, it should bring us to relationship. Because if you have ever wanted to know how God feels about you and who he is and what he is like, you need look no further than the cross. That is who God is. That man hanging and dying and rising again for us, praying for his executioners that God would forgive them. That's who God is. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the radiance of all of God's glory, the exact imprint of his nature. When this exchange happens, we see who our Father in heaven really is. So if this is what all this was for, that we might become the righteousness of God, if God's reconciling work was to bring us to him, that we might become the righteousness of God, then what does that mean for us in our daily lives? How do we live that out? Well, this is why Paul talks about ambassadors for Christ. There's a picture here of Nikki Haley, who is our second most recent uh, ambassador to the United Nations, I think. Do we have a picture? There we go. There we go. This is Nikki Haley. She, uh, again, was the second most recent ambassador to the United Nations. And whenever I think of an ambassador, I think of someone like Nikki Haley, uh, someone who represents our nation to the rest of the world, that goes and speaks on our behalf, that represents the plans of our nation, the hopes of our nation. Uh, But there's also a different kind of ambassador, an ambassador like Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, one of the greatest ambassadors in history for Nike. Uh, And Michael Jordan was an ambassador for Nike because he represented what that company valued. He represented what that company was all about, athleticism and achievement. And he was pretty cool too, right? We can't not mention Ambassador Michael Jordan when we are in the Chicagoland area. And Michael Jordan was so committed to this that what the deal that you make when you become an ambassador for an organization like Nike is you commit that you are going to wear all of Nike's things. You are not going to wear anybody else's. You are going to talk about Nike. You are going to live and breathe Nike. If anyone comes into contact with you, they're going to make sure, you're going to make sure that they know about Nike. And that's what Michael Jordan did in excess is he put Nike on the map, right? He created brands for them. He made all kinds of money for Nike out of representing them. Now, when we think about ambassadors, there's a lot of ways we can think about it, but I want to think this morning a little bit about how Michael Jordan did his ambassadorial work, this dedication he had to representing the brand that was behind him, to representing the one who commissioned him to be their ambassador. Because all of us, like Michael Jordan, should be devoted and committed and excited about the one who we represent. We should be the kind of people who everything we say, everything we do, is an intentional representation of the one who's loved us and saved us. See, an ambassador isn't limited by 40 hours a week. They're not limited by certain circumstances and certain places. It is who they are. An ambassador is always on call representing the king. Here's what Paul tells us in verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God, making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. If we were to stop any kind of message we have at church at the fact that God has saved us and rescued us and loved us, that would be a spectacular message in and of itself, but it would also be a half gospel. It would be half the message. Because he has not reconciled us to stand still. He's reconciled us to go out. To represent. And this is where the rubber meets the road in the Christian life. This is the goal of the Christian life. Paul says, therefore. 
if God has done this, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. If God has entrusted us with the message of reconciliation, if he has made this amazing exchange on the cross, then that means our lives need to change. If we are a new creation, then by default we should look different, we should live differently. And I think it means we should live a life that's different in three ways. First of all, a life that's incarnational. A life that's incarnational. Incarnation literally means to embody in the flesh. And Christ was God in the flesh. That's why we call it his incarnation because God came in the flesh. He embodied himself within the person of Jesus Christ. And now, as ambassadors for Christ, you and I are God's kingdom in the flesh. Everything that he has long desired for, everything that he has planned for from the first day of creation, from before creation, that's now in us in the flesh. We all of us have a ministry to complete. We all of us have been called to go and live out God's kingdom. So that when people look at you and me and they look at all of our flaws and our brokenness and then the grace that God has applied to that and the way that God has loved us through that and most importantly the way that God is changing us from that, that they will see the kingdom of God living, moving. Paul Tripp, one of my favorite pastors, says that we should always ask ourselves this question. How can I best represent the king in this place with this particular person. Every conversation we have, every interaction we have, how can I best represent the king in this place with this particular person? Is that how you think about your life as a Christian? Is that how you think about the goal of your life as a Christian? How can I best represent the king in this place with this particular person? Is representing Christ to the world something that you clock in and clock out of? That there are slots within your life that you make an intentional effort to share the gospel, to serve people, to love people, but there's always that point in which you clock out and take care of some other things and slide that to the side. Is it making its way into your family, your extended family, your friends, your co-workers? Are people around you seeing the kingdom of God at work? And I want to be very, very careful to say we're not talking about perfection here. The kingdom of God, the righteousness of God is that he has made sinners righteous. And so yours and I's flaws, so long as we bring them to Christ and elevate Christ, can actually be a way that we can show the world God's grace. Not because sin is okay, but because Jesus has dealt with that. What are the ways in which you can go and represent the king in your sphere of influence? What are the ways in which you can become an incarnation of the kingdom of God? Is it the neighbors next door on your street? Is it simple things like creating baskets for them, caring for them, for those in need? Being a part of a ministry here at Chapel Street Church, although certainly that is not a limit or the end all of what it means to be a representation of Jesus. And in fact, I could ask you a whole set of questions about ways that you could perhaps think about being an ambassador, but I'm willing to bet that you all have much better ideas than I do. When you look at the gifts that God has put within you, the skills, the talents, the passions and excitements, then you will find a way that you are called to be a representative of the kingdom of God on earth. Because it's not about Christian decorations. It's not about looking good on the outside. It is about a change within us towards other people. Christmas time, we all get gifts. And we leave them under the tree, wrapped up, get excited to open them. But if we never opened them, we'd never see the good stuff that was inside. Well, that's kind of what the grace of Jesus is like. It's been given to us, and now it's time to unwrap it. Now it's time to open up those boxes and let the world see what's inside of them. Secondly, being an ambassador for Christ means that we will live a life that is Christ-centered. What do we mean by Christ-centered? What we mean to ask this question. Is the life that you're living more about your kingdom or God's kingdom? Is it set on Christ? Does it revolve around Christ? Is he 
the end all of everything that you are doing, or is he one thing amongst many? See, we all struggle to represent Christ in the flesh 24-7 and to be on call as an ambassador for Christ 24-7. But that's usually because we want to make time to be an ambassador for our own kingdom as well. We want to represent our values. We want to dip right back into that self-righteousness that was there before Christ saved us and say, well, maybe this is what's good for my life. Maybe this is what's good for other people's lives. Here's what it looks like to be an ambassador for your own kingdom. You spend most of your time with the type of people that you like to be around. You don't want to be around people that make you uncomfortable, think differently than you, have different struggles than you. You keep yourself safe from experiences that might be difficult or outside of your comfort zone. I don't really want to serve with these people because I don't really know how to do that. I don't really want to give my time to this cause because I don't have a passion for that. The plans that you make for yourself and the decisions you make are largely based based on what makes your life better. And it's got this self-centered goal rather than an othered goal. But God's kingdom is better than our kingdom. And so God in his amazing love, is often going to disrupt our kingdom, take us off our throne, and set us towards his kingdom because he's got something better. But the glory of the gospel is that God's kingdom does more for us than any of the things that we could build in our own kingdom. We'll find more joy in it than we can ever find. The disruptions and the discomfort don't have to be barriers to your joy and your passion. Serving in a ministry that doesn't feel like your ministry that's hard for you, doesn't have to be a barrier to joy, they can be a doorway to it. They can be a doorway to you knowing Jesus better. And they can absolutely 100% be a doorway towards others knowing Jesus better too. Listen to Paul's words. And he says, I want you to pray in Ephesians and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am the ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Chains are a pretty inconvenient thing to have. And I'm willing to bet that Paul had a very hard time being an ambassador for Christ while sitting in a cell. But he nevertheless was committed and devoted to it, to represent the king. To ask the question, how can I best represent the king in this particular place with this particular person? And lastly, the life of an ambassador is inviting. Paul says in this passage in verse 20, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That is the invitation. That is the call of an ambassador of Christ. We implore the world to be reconciled to God. The best way I can tell this story is through the story of my sister. Uh, My sister is a woman that I deeply admire and look up to, a woman who loves Jesus and is one of the best ambassadors for Christ I've ever known. When she was a very young girl in a family where not a lot of us knew Jesus, uh, she came to know the Lord. And she set about making her life about others. So to the point where in a country where there was not many Christians doing this, there was not many people doing this, she decided that she was going to spend her first year of college working with a Christian organization called Oasis to spread the gospel amongst people in Manchester. And I remember thinking, as I'm a lot younger than her, watching that and thinking, why would someone want to spend that time telling other people about Jesus? But it wasn't just big things that she did like that. It was little things. It was the way that she chose to spend time with me talking about Jesus. It was the ways in which she spent time seeking to help me and show me grace and love me and serve me, even though I was an annoying little brother. There was many things that she did. There was one point where an American missionary came over from the United States, the man who became my mentor, and because he had nowhere to live, my sister and my brother-in-law decided because they were representatives of Christ, because they were seeking to find the best way to represent the king in that particular moment to that particular person, they decided to let him and his friends stay rent-free in their home so that he could focus on serving and loving others and they could care for him. 
And so often the time when I tell my story, I talk about my mentor, Toby, who helped me come to know Jesus. But really behind Toby was someone who was willing to be the representative of the king to him so that he could be the representative of the king to me. Because of my sister's choices, because she chose to be a representative of the king and ask herself the question, how can I best represent Jesus to this world? Here I stand. And here you stand. Because of someone else who chose to be an ambassador. Someone who chose to be a representative of Jesus in some way, somehow. Friends, if we come together and we seek Christ together and we say we want to best represent Christ in all of the places of our lives and in all the people that we come across, there is absolutely no telling what might happen amongst our cities. So today, let's come to the one who has made a great exchange for us. Let us serve him and love him and let us represent him to everyone around us. Would you pray with me as we come to worship? Father, thank you for the great exchange that you made on the cross on our behalf. Thank you for your great love for us that has redeemed us and reconciled us and made us the righteousness of God. And Father, now I pray and I, just like Paul, implore that you would make us ambassadors that serve you and ask the question, how can we best represent you in this particular place to this particular person? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.